Well, welcome to what is the first workshop for IBF uh, 2016. Um, I'm glad that there's a few here because I'm one of the less well-known speakers <laughs> or presenters. Um, so it's good that uh, you guys took the risk and came here so that I can do a, an evaluation of how long a presentation should be, where I should cut things off, and things of that nature, okay? Uh, just so that you know that this is on Christian warfare or spiritual warfare, so if this is not the workshop you need to be in, just so that you know what this is all about. All right, so let's just open in a word of prayer. Our God and Father, we thank you that you are a great God. You're an awesome God. A God who saw it fit to reach down to human beings, though rebels they were. Yet in your grace, you're willing to become our substitute. And because we are known by you, and everyone here that has accepted you, Father, we know that we are accepted in the beloved. We have some tremendous benefits. As you're reminded in the messages that we are seated in the heavenlies, we have a calling because you are our caller. <coughs> this morning, Father, we pray that you would lead us to the truths of spiritual warfare, recognizing that you are our supreme commander and that we would tune our voices to hear one voice. And may Jesus Christ get the glory. Amen. Okay, so um, one thing that I should have told you as you were coming in is, uh, maybe I'll need some help here, distributing these. Uh, these handouts, if you don't mind. You can go okay, ahead. they're crisscross. As they are passing out this thing, you know, um, I had the presentation downloaded on Google Drive, but you would not believe the trouble we had get, just getting it printed, <laughs> recognizing that this is really a spiritual warfare. Um, we had the head IT technology person come here, we had Saji working on it like crazy, and we just could not get it printed. And so Saji is back here, and thank you for your help, brother. Without your help, I don't think we could have gotten it done. Anyway, um, the handout is being passed out. Thank you. And what I'm going to try to do is try to follow the handout as much as I can. Uh, clearly, I've edited it to make it fit to at least about three to five pages or six pages. Um, one of the reasons I created the handout is because it's hard to complete the entire message. And uh, there are many people here who are probably a lot more erudite than I am. You can probably go and edit it or, or critique me when you get home saying that you didn't finish this passage or you should have included this verse or whatever it is. So um, with that, I'll give you the outline, okay? The first point we have in your handout is the enigma of this battle. The enigma. The enigma means it's a conundrum. We don't know exactly what's happening. Um, we, we think we know, but the paradigm is shifted. Um, it's like if you go to Mars, you know, you say, well, what happened to all the buildings? Well, you're in a different paradigm, in a, in a different environment. And uh, many people say, well, why are we in it? How do we fit in? Uh, I had an, originally an, uh, an illustration for a video from the, for the movie, The Imitation Game. But as I watched it, there were some risque scenes in there, so I decided to cut it out. So anyway, let's just first look at 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 18. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 18. It's a familiar verse. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen. For what is seen is temporary, and what is unseen is eternal. Then the same epistle, chapter 10, verse 3. 
For though we live in the world, we do not wage war as the world does. The weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. And we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. The enigma of earthly beings in a struggle against invisible forces. The enigma that, that human beings are really in, in, a, in a warfare. Um, and then it says, we are waging war not as the world does, not using earthly weapons. And so a whole bunch of questions pop up, right? If, if you're like me, I mean, I'm, I'm thinking about this. And says, well, who is this enemy? Why would God allow this enemy to propagate and to prosper? Why does an all-powerful God just stamp him out? Why are we in this battle? How can ordinary human beings defeat this powerful enemy? Those are, those are some of the questions that often come to mind, often asked, by, asked to me by college kids that I've taught, and high school kids, and even adults. I don't know if you've had that question. In fact, I was speaking on the introduction of this at our church uh, last Sunday. And there, right away, there was a person who says, I can't believe this, that God is allowing us to do this. The all-powerful God. Why would he do this? Have you ever thought about that? Why? Why does God not stamp out Satan in an instant? In fact, if you think about it, we should say, when we say a battle, come on. I have my six-year-old grandson, you know, that I wrestle with. Every once in a while, we've wrestled and, and I make him think that he won. Because with a flick of my wrist, right, he's done. So there really is no battle. At the same time, the scripture reminds us there is a battle and that is the enigma. There is, and so for us, we need to rec recognize that this is a real struggle with the forces of God and a powerful enemy. Who are God's forces? Well, from the scriptures, we know that they are angels, and then there are believers. Now remember, as creator, everything he creates has at least three objectives. It is his plan. He never sat down and discussed his plan with you or me or any of the angels. It is his plan. Ephesians chapter 1 verse 11. It is his purpose and his purpose is always to bring him glory. And secondly, it is for his pleasure to retain and expand his disciples. Revelation chapter 4, verse 11, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 18 and 19. Now, his plan, what does his plan imply? His plan means that his plan has a structure. His plan means that his plan has an order. His plan has consequences. His plan has a domain. His plan has limits. We need to understand that. Because if you don't understand that, we will continue to raise those questions. That plan is called God's government. God's government, we always talk about God's grace, right? There is God's glory, and there is a dynamic equilibrium between God's grace and God's government. When you trample and trivialize God's grace, God's government takes over. God's government is about order, and consequences. And based on that, he has created a certain design. In other words, just look at our human body, right? We have a nose here and our fingertips over here. Why is that? We don't know. I mean, we know now that we know science, but he never sat down and discussed any of these things with us. He didn't put our pancreas over here, right? And when we plant a seed, the roots go down, the stem comes up. That's his design. 
And he has this design for man. He has this design for angels. He has this design for heavenly bodies. He has this design for earthly bodies. He has this design for those under the earth, everything. And that's why it says in Colossians chapter 1, he has created every, Colossians chapter 1 verse 11, he has created everything according to his plan. So his plan, there is a domain of influence. By the way, in your handout, I've created some blank, blank spots. If you want to fill it out, you can just to keep you awake. That means there is effectiveness. There's a domain of influence. For example, if I go just the way I am to space, I am toast, right? I can't exist in that domain. I have no influence in that domain. So when the astronauts go to the moon or to space, what do they do? They take the Earth's atmosphere with them. They are completely shielded. So there is a domain of influence. Then there is a degree of separation. He has created those distinctions, land and sea. Man and woman, get it? He has created those distinctions. There's a degree of separation. There is also a determination of operations based on structure and function. The way it is structured and the way it functions, they correspond. And finally, there is the duration of existence. Everything that he has created, he has given an expiry date, except for the word of God. Everything that he created. For example, the other day there was a, a rain in our yard and I went out into, the, in, into my garage and I saw all these earthworms creeping up. Man, what do I do? One came, came across me, I just snapped him out. Done. His domain of influence is gone, right? My domain of influence supersedes and there is a duration of existence. So whether it's the sun, the moon, the stars, you know, he's, he's created those domains of influence and domains of in, uh, degree of separation, determination of operation. And so man, therefore, it has been created with a free will. And it means that we are spiritual beings, right? We are tripartite spiritual beings. Animals are, on the other hand, instinctive beings. They go by intuition. They go from north to south. The Canadian geese migrate at a certain time. They are instinctive beings. They are not rational. So God is a supreme and sovereign commander. You know what that means? In his sovereignty, he does as he pleases, and whatever he does is right. He is a supreme commander. That means that he is omnipresent, omniscient, and omnipotent. He will win. He is winning, even when it seems like he is losing, right? And we have ample stories in the Old Testament. Look at Joseph, right? He was put in a pit by his brothers. Suddenly he becomes a prime minister. And so when they come together, what happens? He says, you thought it for evil, but God thought it for good. In the meantime, anybody looking at that, that video scene, if you might, would say, wow, I can't believe this little kid, jealous as he was, he made his brothers jealous. Suddenly he becomes the prime minister, the second in charge of Egypt. Same thing happens to the Lord Jesus Christ. He is born, Herod wants to kill him, he flees to Egypt, he comes back in, during, in, in the interim. There are many people that want to kill him. They want to throw him off the cliff, but nothing happens, right? Because it's according to, the, according to the predetermined plan of God. And though he was born for 30 years, what, what was he doing? In fact, there's a, rec there's a recent movie called The Risen or The Young Messiah or something like that. We don't know what he, what he was doing, right? All we know is the fact that, you know, at the age of 11 or 12 years old, he grew in stature with God and with man, right? He found favor. And we find, we find that he was knowledgeable enough of the scriptures because even the scribes and the Pharisees were appalled at his knowledge. But how does he do this? He do this, God molds our free will by a combination of things. 
He is a micromanager and a macromanager, which is hard for us to understand. He's simultaneously figuring all this stuff out. He's not figuring out things as they go. He is not taken by surprise. He knows everything that's happening. For God, everything is in the present. He uses a combination of pressure. He uses pain. And he uses pleasure. And he weaves these things individually in each life, corresponding to another brother or sister's life, corresponding to another nation's life, corresponding to a world at large. And he's doing that for the 6.3 billion people that are living on this earth. And he's doing that for all the nations. So, I'm going long on the enigma, because most of the other things you've studied. The struggle between God's forces and the enemies. Foremost among them is the enemy called, this is in page two, by the way. Uh, foremost among the enemies is Satan. Now, just need to understand this. Satan is God's devil by consequence of his established order. Remember I said God has a plan. In his plan, there are structure, there are functions, there is, there is limits, there's liberties, and he has created this world and everything based on certain cause and effect. If I go to the World Trade Center, the new World Trade Center, and I jump, what happens? I can't say I'm a believer, right? And say, well, please don't, don't let that, you know, the force of gravity operate on me. However, there is another force, another law that is operational that can circumvent the law of gravity. What is that? The law of aerodynamics, right? That's why when you throw a ball up, the ball comes down, but you throw a bird up, what happens? The bird flies. The bird is able, within its domain, to overcome the law of gravity. So Satan is God's devil by consequence of him violating the standard God has set. But what are the limits of Satan? He is not omnipotent. He is not omniscient. He is not omnipresent. What does that mean? He can influence, but not direct. Well, because he does not know the full extent of every aspect of the future and its relative consequences. Let me explain. Maybe a person is jealous in his workplace. He says, I'm going to shoot my supervisor. Goes home. And Satan is filling his heart and his mind with rage and with jealousy and with anger. So he goes and picks up a gun. He goes to shoot. Satan does not know that that gun might jam. Satan does not know that the target will move. Get it? Satan can influence. But Satan cannot direct the consequences. So, we know that Satan was created as an angel who was cast out of heaven, right? Revelation chapter 12, verses 7 through 9. And then again, the Lord Jesus Christ in Luke chapter 10, verse 18, what does it say? I saw Satan fall like lightning. Now, I'm not going to go into the, the origin of Satan with Lucifer. There are different schools of thought and so on. And I'm not giving a course in demonology or angelology. So we just need to supersede all that and go move on to God's established principles. So along the way, we know as believers that God has established certain principles to be enforced just by virtue of his order, his plan, his design. And that I, once again, I tell you, it's God's government. And I'll give you an example, OK? I'm sure you know that there is a, a debate in, in, in a circle, believer circles, uh, maybe in the brethren circles, I'm not sure, you know, about head covering, right? When should we wear it? And there is one of the debates that high school kids and college kids that I teach and I've 
talked to and discussed with will tell me this. You know, I can't believe that in your church, you teach that women are inferior. Because they have to wear, the women, the men don't. I said, the men don't have to wear a hat, right? Most people do, even in the United States, they take the hat out when they move, come into our building. That's just so enforcing 50% of what 1 Corinthians talks about. Then, I'm in this big debate in a conference, and they're talking about this. And I say, well, why is it that you enforce this? And I said, you need to understand the difference between God's grace and God's government. Under God's grace, every human being is equal. It has nothing to do with equality. Man, woman, child, if they know the Lord Jesus Christ, they are accepted in the beloved. It doesn't matter if you're were formerly a Hindu. It doesn't matter if you're formerly a homosexual. It doesn't matter if you're formerly a drug addict, a former murderer or a thief. At the foot of the cross, everyone is equal. That's God's grace. But our God's government says, uh-huh, there are some differences in the kingdom. He said, well, Abe, what are you talking about? Well, let's take a look at the president of the United States, right? He's a citizen of the United States, so am I. Under the Constitution, we are both equal. But let me see if I can get into the White House. What's going to happen? So, sorry, Secret Service protection, right? And if I tell him, well, you're discriminating against me. I'm equal just like you are. See, it's, it's not about equality, it's about God's... It's about government, it's about roles, responsibilities, order, design, structure. And so the head covering is not a contradiction. It is about God's order. So God has established certain principles, right? Here is the one principle. To whom much is given, much is required. And that evaluation is not based on what you think or what I think. It's based on God's schedule, it's based on God's scale, and based on God's strategy. How he is planning to enforce certain things, maybe in 2025. To whom much is given, much is required. Principle number two, greater the revelation, greater the punishment or the condemnation. So now let's apply these principles to what happened to Satan. Satan is living in the full revelation of God's glory, right? He understands certain aspects in heaven. And this aspect about greater the revelation, greater the consequences of reward and punishment is, is what we do, right? We want proportional justice. God is fair. So the angels who dwell in the full light of God's glory, when they sinned, when they rebelled against God's established order, he just enforces the consequences of his established order. Second Peter chapter two, verse four, and Jude chapter, uh, Jude, Jude verse six. It is the sin of provocation and presumption exceeding the limits of authority, right? If you hire a person who mows your lawn, for example, and you are sitting in your living room and reading newspaper and he comes in and he says, excuse me, sir, you can't read the newspaper. So why not? You can't. You gotta help me mow the lawn. Would you allow that? He has transgressed his domain. He has transgressed the limits of his authority. And we have no problem when people transgress the limits of their authority, just excuse me, right? When I, was, when I was chief operating officer, there were 230 people reporting to me, you know? And every now and then they'll say, well, my boss did this, my supervisor did this. And what do we do? 
We have certain progressive steps of discipline. Human beings do that all the time. God did that to Satan just like that. He said, because you sinned and you have the full revelation of the glory, there is no opportunity for repentance. Irwin Lutzer in his book, The Serpent in Paradise says, the moment Satan rolled the dice, he was doomed to disappointment and destruction. His future was gambled in a slot machine that paid no dividends. He had miscalculated the power and intention of Satan, underestimated God, and overestimated himself. How did he underestimate God? You know, only one third of the angels followed him. Only one third, two thirds still remained with the full revelation that God had given him. An enigma. So what are the consequences of Satan's rebellion? What are the punishments for angels? What is the punishment for anyone who rebels against the supreme commander? If you and I as human beings rebel, what are we told? The wages of, that is called sin, right? Transgressing the boundary. The standard that he has established. His standard is not up for debate. His standard is clear. And along the way, because as human beings, we don't understand absolute standards, he has established certain criteria all the way from Genesis to Revelation, including all the way through all the books of, Reve of Leviticus and Numbers. And we say, well, how, that's so crazy that God didn't allow Moses to get into the promised land. That's so unfair that somebody that was studying the ark and, and wanted to prop the, the ark up, you know, I mean, common sense, would anybody would do that, right? What happens? Well, you see, if you go back, the ark should not have been transported in that manner, period. So there are all these consequences that God has established. So for angels, there is no repentance and there is no atonement. For man, Hebrews chapter 2, verse 16 and 17, let's just read that. Hebrews chapter 2. I'll read from verse 14 because I'm going to allude to verse 14 as well later on. Since the children have flesh and blood, he too shared in their humanity so that by his death he might destroy him who holds the power of death. That is the devil. And free those who all their lives were held to in slavery by their fear of death. For surely it is not angels that he helps. Get it? but Abraham's descendants. For this reason, he had to be made like his brothers in every way in order that he might become a merciful and a faithful high priest in service to God and that he might make atonement for the sins of the people because he himself suffered when he was tempted. He is able to, do, to help those who are being tempted. And we might just allude to the temptations by Satan of God in this, in this uh, lesson. God has given Satan an expiry date, okay? Just like he's given all of us. And he gave us this promise in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. Enmity between Satan and the woman. Satan's offspring and God's offspring. The woman's offspring will, cut, will crush Satan's head and Satan's offspring will bruise the woman's seed. This enmity has at least five lessons associated with this, and you may come up with more. And this is not in the handout. Satan is given permission to be ruler of this world. John chapter 12, verse 31. Satan has been given permission under his plan to be the ruler of this world, and he's often referred to as the God of this world, right? Satan is being taught that he could never have 100% followers. Now you know how you and I get in. Satan is being taught that he cannot have 100% of the followers. Lesson number three. God would show Satan again and again and again 
that his standards of holiness and his moral and spiritual victories are by spiritual force of love and righteousness and justice. It's not physical force. First John chapter three, verse eight, and Hebrews chapter two, verse, three, verse four, 14. Lesson number four, God would show that his son Jesus would be obedient under the most excruciating circumstances of pain and temptation. And even when, when, when Satan attempted to tempt the Lord Jesus Christ, Jesus stood the test, right? And along the way, God in his plan is showing Satan that when he condemned him to hell, God was just because he is showing that there is a person here who can meet the test. And he would not bow to the temptations of pride or prejudice. Lesson number five. Millions of his sons, millions of his sons would follow his son and ascribe him the worship that Satan so coveted. Isn't that interesting, right? So you say, well, what is the enigma? This is the enigma. That's the enigma is being clarified and crystallized for us. That we, his children, are in the crossfire between the cosmic force, who is a person, the Lord Jesus Christ, and Satan. Satan is not just a force, he is a real person. God therefore takes us through various stages of learning and growth, from faith to faith, from glory to glory. So what happens as soon as we trust him, we are told we become his sons, right? Sons then need to learn to be servants. Servants who are subservient, as in your page two of your handout. Servants who are subservient. How? Guided by the footsteps of their master. Good servants also need to learn to be good stewards. Stewards who are diligent, guiding the fortunes of the master. Good stewards need to learn to be good soldiers. Soldiers who are vigilant, going to fight for the master. So based on that enigma being clarified to some degree, we will now look at Ephesians chapter six. Ephesians chapter six and verse 10. So when we fight, we're not fighting as sons, you're fighting as soldiers, whom God is gradually training up. We fight as soldiers who have to be fit and be ready for the opposition. So with the enigma we say, is there a plan? Is there a purpose? Is there a provision? And is there a participation? Ephesians chapter six and verse 10. I thought I had to turn to that, but I turned it to. Ephesians chapter six, verse 10. Finally, okay, I mean, it's coming to the end of this, this uh, epistle. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. So we have the energy for this battle. The energy for this battle. For example, you know, we, we, if you look at uh, Ephesians chapter one, just for uh, just a brief study on power, if you want to go into that. Ephesians chapter one, verse 19. And 20. And his incomparably, this is, the, this is called the, the, the power prayer, okay? And notice this, how Apostle Paul through the Holy Spirit has constructed this, this particular verse. And his incomparably, I'm reading from the NIV, by the way. And his incomparably great power for us who believe that power is like the working of his mighty strength 
There are four different Greek words used in this one verse. The, the most common term that we all know, the Greek word is dunamis, right? Just for like most people know the word for love is agape. We all know in, in brethren and Christian circles, the word for power is, is dunamis. According, exceeding greatness of power. Dunamis, that is called the intrinsic power. That is power loaned to us. Then there is according to his working. That is the Greek word energia. That's from, from, from what we get the, the energy. Then of according to his mighty power, the word iskus, I-S-C-H-U-S. It's not pronounced iskus, it's pronounced iskus. And finally the word power which is called kratos. So these are the different words that are used. And, and so the, the Apostle Paul is saying that we go in the strength of his power. This is a fight and we are all soldiers. We have to be fit and we have to stay fit. Okay? We have to be fit and we have to stay fit. Our strength, our strength is in the Lord, and therefore that word be strong, the, the grammatical construction of that is be continually strengthened in the power of his might. Getting fit and staying fit. So therefore, first of all we do, we recognize the commander. Every battle needs to have a commander, right? The battle is the Lord's. Ephesians chapter 3, verse 20, he says, He is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that he can ask or think. The battle is the Lord's. Examples, Joshua chapter 5, verse 13 through 15. He has this vision. And you see how Joshua sees God, right? He's seeing God with a sword drawn. Readiness for the battle. That's what Joshua needed. Up until the edges of the promised land, all they needed was Moses. But going into the promised land after redemption, they needed a military commander. And God provides Joshua with that vision of the energy that he has with readiness for battle. So the question really is, how do we respond to the vision God has given us? By our posture, we stand. Remember what God told Joshua? Take off your sandals. When we come to the Lord, for the battle ahead, we keep the load away. And we're standing on holy ground. Then we respond to his voice. His is the only voice that we respond to. That is important. He is just not a sergeant or a private. He is the supreme commander. Just like when we say he is the cornerstone, he is not any brick, he is the cornerstone. So we re respond to his, his voice. And in Joshua chapter 24 and 26, Joshua learned some mighty things. He learned about the need for his location. He, need, he learned about the Lord being lightened, but more importantly, he learned, as for me and my house, I will serve the Lord. So, in this battle, how do we respond? To whom do we respond? We need to view the battle from whose perspective? From his perspective. The battle is not against flesh and blood. So David provides us a perspective, right? When he goes to battle, how big is the giant or how big is the God? That's the, face, that's the battle we have to face. How big is, what does Satan do? Satan magnifies something that should be minimized. And he minimizes something that should be magnified, right? That's called distortion. The battle is not against flesh and blood. So we look at the nature of the enemy. The nature of his en the enemy. To fight this battle, we need to understand the nature of the threat. This is a spiritual war. Ultimately, what does Satan want from us? He wants your and my allegiance. And God who has created, remember the order he created? He's created an order within us. 
He's made us spirit, soul, and body. Spirit to be God conscious, soul to be self conscious, and body to be world conscious. For believers, our salvation is secure. God's love for us is permanently sealed. He can't keep us from reaching heaven. So what does he do? He tries to make us useless on earth. Get it? He tries to make us useless on earth. He uses people by moving them as pawns. He uses our flesh. It's like an autoimmune disorder. You know, he uses our flesh against us. He uses the world against us. That is why it says that the enemies are the world, the flesh, and the devil. The enemy has a hierarchy. Remember the order? God has his hierarchy. Satan has his hierarchy. They're invisible to us. Colossians chapter 1, verse 16. Things visible and invisible. A tremendous number of fallen angels. They have their domain. In fact, some of those, the fallen angels, he has already predicted where they're going to be gone. In Jude chapter six, Jude verse six. Domain, he differentiates, he, he has a duration. They have a heavenly hierarchy. In Colossians chapter one verse 16, he says what? Thrones, dominions, principalities, and powers. That is Satan's hierarchy. Of the 33 and one third percent of the angels that followed him, our warfare is against these. So let me reiterate, Satan is not omnipresent. So then how is he there all, over, all the time? See, the angelic, the angels have bodies. They're not like bodies like you and I have. Their bodies are different. But their bodies are incredibly mobile. They can go from zero to 60 miles in, in milliseconds, but they can't be everywhere. Only God can be everywhere. So he, he dispatches his demons. Satan is not omnipresent, omniscient, or omnipotent, but Satan is powerful. He's a spirit being. While their doom is certain, their daily chore, okay, this is what Satan gets up in the morning for. He says, I am going to harass a Chaco. He has a plan. And you know, when he comes, he, he figures out where was the last time you fell. And he goes precisely to that point because he knows that's your weakness. Because he doesn't know the future. See? So, this battle that we are fighting for is a system of evil where Satan wants to enthrone himself. How does he do this? For the unbeliever, what does the scripture say? He has blinded their minds, right? He clouds them. See, when we were, I think Ben, ben was talking about this morning, you know, I mean, in, in the Garden of Eden, we were built in the image of God, right? But when we sinned, that image was not erased, it was effaced. It was corrupted. It's like looking at a distorted image in the mirror. There are some, still some good things there. That's why unbelievers are philanthropic. They do good things. When an when, uh, when, when, uh, unbeliever is next door to, to another unbeliever, when the house burns, they don't just stand there, right? Generally speaking, they go and try to help. Because we, are still, we have some portion of that image. So our image is not erased, it is effaced. It is distorted. And Satan has blinded the minds of unbelievers. Thus we read of the powers of this dark world. We read of the spiritual forces of evil. We can understand to some degree, right? Why drugs are destroying countless lives, why sodomy laws are getting acceptable, why abortion and pornography are big business, why we can't stop war, why hate and pride and prejudice and fear continue to dominate the minds of people. And every now and then, guess what? Believers get into that fight as well. So certain influences our world. The flesh is against us, right? We don't have time to go into Romans and, and, and look at that battle. 
but the flesh is against us. And there are three organs that are particularly implicated. There's the mind, there's the tongue, and there's the heart, <laughs> okay? And you find references to all of these in the scriptures. The flesh is what is called soulish, you know? We, we go after things that we can see, and therefore we create ungodly practices. Ignoring and ignoring and, and getting ignorant of God's word. We, uh, the, there is a, a cloudiness of mind. And that's why uh, Apostle Peter reminds us, be, be therefore clear thinkers. How can you become a clear thinker? You have to think according to the way God thinks. And the only way we know we can think according to the way God thinks is that the more time we spend in God's word, right? And the more time we spend in God's word, it spurs us to talk to him, to converse with him. And then when we converse with him, he shows us, hey, you know, you were very prideful. You were angry when he talked to your wife. That's why in the book of Ephesians, you know, when we talk about husbands love your wives, wives love, uh, respect your husbands, the, the gospel needs to be practiced where first? In the home, not in the church, in the home. In the home is where our kids learn Oh, that is what God's love is all about. Because a crack in the home is a crater in society. Because the world gets its lawyers and its doctors and its computer programmers and its janitors and its truck drivers from the home, right? The presidents and the kings, they're reared in homes. So in the, in the home, husbands loving your wives as Christ loved the church. Oh, that is gospel. You know what? Satan does not want that. Satan does not want that. So, so I very quickly here. The world, the culture, the communication, the civilization. If you talk to our kids, right? Anybody younger than me is oh, my kid, okay? There are two huge influences that dominate their conversation. Just walk around, just talk to them. You know what they are? Movies and music. I'm telling you, they, they talk, they, 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 they take quotes from a movie clip and they will interject and they will say, like, like what happened in A Few Good Men. Or what, you know, I mean, we, we don't even know some of the movies that they watch, right? Movies and music. In movies and music, you see a few gods. And I, and I got this from my good friend, Rod Dewberry, who will be, who will be speaking at uh, FIBA, I think. God of fact. What is the God of fact? I have all the knowledge I need. I don't need this book. God of fact, okay? God of flesh and God of filth. Thankless and truthless. You see, if you Take a look at some of the trailers of these movies. It's no longer about skill. It's about shock value, right? The more blood there is, the greater the, the, greater the sales of the movie. God of flesh and God of filth. Then there's the God of fame. Know what that means? Peer pressure. I want to please everybody. And what is the savior of the God of fame? Self-esteem, okay? God of fortune, abundance of things, possessions, gain is important, profit becomes the highest motive. God of freedom, postmodernism. In postmodernism, everything is deconstructed. If you say love, well, your love is different than my love. Your knowledge is different than my knowledge. Okay, don't talk to me about God's love because you don't know God's love anyway. How do I know that? Because I've engaged in conversations with the college kids. So how does he work? With all of these gods in our culture, how does he work? He dilutes the effects. You know what he says? It's not as bad. Not as bad. He denies. Uh, it's not real. You know, it's just an illusion. It's going to pass away. 
finally, when we are harassed completely, we say, oh, man, I don't know if I can take it anymore. Remember I said that, you know, I was almost going to give up on these handouts. I had it all done on my, on my email. I put it on Google Drive, you know, I mean, and we tried to print and print, and we did all kinds of stuff. You know, up until 10, 15, we just could not get this printed. Now, I could have given up, right? I just sat in a corner and prayed. And within 30 seconds, this is, my brother said, I got it. You know, my brother said, we got it. You know, when we get harassed, what happens? We, we despair, right? And we give up. And therefore, he says, therefore, do not lose heart. And finally, our desires, 1 John chapter 2, verses 12, 15, and 17. And I'm just going to go over the outline very quickly here. What are the notions of our enemy? Okay? He's referred to in the Bible as the God of this world, right? The scripture says by the quote from, from Jesus Christ himself, he was a murderer from the beginning. How was he a murderer from the very beginning? Remember what he told Eve? If you eat this, you shall not surely die. But God had said if they eat it, he will die, right? So he was a murderer from the very beginning. He lies. That's his mother tongue. You know what I mean? He's a father of lies. I remember a good friend of mine was, uh, was uh, asked to marry uh, you know, two people, and one of the persons was an unbeliever. And he says, would you conduct the wedding? He says, no, absolutely not. I don't want the devil to be a father-in-law. You know? <laughs> so, so devil, he's a father of lies. He's a murderer from the very beginning. He's a deceiver. The woman saw what? Ah, oh, this is nutritious. Any registered dietitian would say, yeah, take it. This was pleasing to the eye, aesthetically beautiful, nutritionally good, and above all, desirable. For wisdom, you'll know good and bad. Wow. Wouldn't you like that kind of food? If somebody advertised some cereal like that, says, you know, good for food, pleasing to the eye, desirable for wisdom, you say, oh, I want it. So what are the five or six things that Satan is? He is subtle. He's a stalker, right? He goes around like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. He's a supplanter. He's a schemer. He's a seducer. He's a stealer. And then we want to go into the names of the, of the devil, okay? Now, as far as the equipment goes, I'm sure you've heard many sermons on this. So I'm just going to give you a quick overview. The belt of truth. In the Roman, in the Roman soldier. Now, you have to understand the background of this, right? So, so Paul is a prisoner in Rome when he's writing this. So I, I don't know, but you know, he sees a Roman soldier and he says, uh-huh, I can see his armor. I can see how his belt is. The belt of truth talks about integrity. In postmodernism, there is no single source of truth. There is a feat. Shh. There's a, I'm sorry, there's a breastplate of righteousness. Talks about purity. There is a feat shot with the gospel of priests. There is tranquility. Going according to our commander's direction. There is a shield of faith. The Roman soldier's shield of faith covered all, it was just covered with leather so that the flaming arrows could not attack him. John Philip says, evil spirits to titillate our senses, inflame our desires, corrupt our souls, weaken our wills, deceive our minds, deaden our conscience, but most importantly, they cultivate doubt. At some point in time, brothers and sisters, we have to say, you know what, I trust my Jesus. You can't leave this, this gate open too long. That doesn't mean that you won't have certain doubts about certain passages, but certain things you have to be clarified by now. You have to know that if I trust Christ, he is my savior. He is going to take me to his abode. In my father's house are many mansions. You can't say, well, and I understand. This is when, when people die, well, somebody asked me when my dad died, you know, do you know where he is? I said, he's in heaven. How do you know? I don't, I don't know. All I can say is what the scripture tells me, right? The helmet of salvation literally means the helmet of deliverance. This is not about being saved. It's about keeping the, the salvation that you already know. And finally, 
the exercise in this battle. How do we fight? Take your stand. You have to stand, right? We have to stand. We can't run, we can't hide. It says in verse 14 of Ephesians chapter 6, stand firm. Why? Because we fight from victory ground. We fight because Christ has already won the victory. We don't give ground like the wise, the, the, the brave men of, of, of David, David's mighty men. Shama in the field of lentils, what happens? He says, he stood his ground. Now the question is, why did those mighty men do that? Why did they do that? For one thing and one thing only. For the love of their master, right? How did one of those mighty men know that David needed a drink of water? Because he heard him. He was sensitive to his longings because he was close to his master. And finally, we take our stand, but we also bow the knee. Verse 18, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit. The word prayer here in the Greek is P-R-O-S-E-U-C-H-E. -E. That, that word defines it that you're always praying to a God who is powerful. Recognizing his power and sufficiency. We go there, right? And then you, you have the remainder of the, of the handout there that we can go to a heavenly place, a hidden place, and a holy place. Well, um, this battle is real. This battle is something that you and I have no choice. The enigma is why are we in it, right? It's according to his plan, his purpose, and for his pleasure. You and I won't understand everything that he does, okay? Because we are finite human beings. But one day, he is going to, you know what he's got? He's got eternity to teach us about the exceeding riches of his grace. So may the Holy Spirit enable us to recognize the voice of the commander, follow only his voice, take a stand, and, oh, brothers and sisters, let's not neglect the prayer meeting in our home, and in our churches. Let's close in prayer. Father, we thank you that you have provided for us an amazing sketch of who you are and what you are doing in this world, even as you have released Satan into, to be the God of this world. Thank you, Father, that you have not left us helpless or hopeless, that you have given us the Holy Spirit that have given us weapons for warfare. We pray, Father, that you would encourage us to put that, that weapon on each time, Father, recognizing that we have to be girded with the, with the belt of truth, with the breastplate of righteousness, with our feet shod with the gospel of peace. And, Father, that we would be willing to draw the sword and use it as the Spirit directs. Guide us, Father, for, for all of the meetings here today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.